It's July, so that means redraft season. It's creeping up on us, and there's no better way to kick off redraft season than by dipping your toes into the Fantasy Pros Championship on FFPC. I'm Tom Strachan, joined as always by Andrew Erickson. And tonight we are drafting in the Fantasy Pros Championship, and you can too, getting $25 off your first entry into the world's largest redraft contest by using the code Fantasy Pros when you sign up. Andrew, like I just said, this is the biggest redraft contest around. We've got a few minutes till draft starts. We'll be picking at pick 11 in this tight end premium redraft contest. What is it about this contest that stands out the most to you? Well, Tom, first off, happy Sunday. Sunday fun day for us drafting here. Top of July, July 4th just kicked off. We just finished that up, and now we're we're in full redraft mode. So I'm super excited to be here drafting in the FFPC Again, you talked about it at the top, one of the biggest tournaments in the redraft. And it was funny, we were talking earlier, we got to turn off our best ball brains because that's not going to help us here. We got to draft running backs. We got to look at tight end premium scoring. So this is going to be a ton of fun. And I, I totally just ignored your first question because I just took the show off the rails already. I'm, I'm wired here on this Sunday. Now, I know it's even later for you across the pond, but your initial question again, Tom, was what? I was just asking what stands out the most for you, but yeah, 9 p.m. here, 4 p.m. where you are, like, it's perfect time for drafting. I mean, there's nothing better to do on Sundays. But as you mentioned, yeah, time premium does matter. It does matter to switch your brain off from best ball because the running backs go so much earlier here than they do. People in actually best ball like drafts. running backs in this format, <laughs> not like underdog or DraftKings necessarily. We're going to actually need to invest significant draft capital at some point into running backs. But other things to keep in mind with the format, we only have to start two running backs. Potentially we have an extra flex spot, which could be a running back wide receiver or tight end. We start two wide receivers as well, quarterback and defense and kicker. So I, I did my kicker research, did my DST research. I I'm ready to go. So in the later rounds, we're not going to be scrambling. I, I already looked at the ECR kicker ranking. So we're going to be good to go, Tom. I'm feeling good. Yeah, that's it. I mean, we have so many resources to us on fantasypros.com to get us set up for these. Loads of FFPC strategy articles and bits like that, players to target in this format. And when you compare ADP between Underdog and DraftKings and FFPC and Drafters and everywhere else, it's the tight ends how much they get pushed up because of the extra premium put on them here. So every tight end catch gets an extra half point PPR on top of your usual one point PPR. And there's guys at the top of the draft board who that is absolutely worth chasing. You know, we'll see multiple tight ends go within the first three rounds here. But then as you get down the draft board, there's guys like, you know, you don't need to chase the likes of Hayden Hurst and Colby Parkinson for the sake of it. But we also want to make sure we draft enough tight ends that we have decent options when we get to it. The draft has just started. We are picking at the 11th spot, like I said. Um, this tournament, though, there's a lot of different little extra kicks to it that make it really interesting. So 12-team league, part one, the regular season is weeks one to 12. Then part two, the league playoffs, which is playoffs within just this 12-team league, are weeks 13 and 14. So the top four teams play off at that point, and then the teams that progress through that, the top two teams, go into the championship round which is weeks 15 to 17, and it's just an all-out point sprint in those three weeks to score as many points as possible. So there's so many little nuances which we can get into as we go through this. But straight from the off, Bijan Robinson goes at the 102 ahead of Christian McCaffrey. We said that they like running backs here, and they definitely do, but <laughs> how do you feel about that first four start? Well, I have Bijan ranked ahead of Christian McCaffrey, so I don't think it's bad. Now we're seeing uh, at number five, just said Jameer Gibbs go off the board. This is crazy. We're getting three running backs already in the first round. I'm already having fun. We just started, and we have to thank the content gods because they gave us the 11th pick, which is perfect, so we can talk in between the picks. I, I mean, that's the best because if we had gotten – five or six we're scrambling we're trying to talk about the analysis what's happened what's what's going to happen but we're picking at 11 like you said at the top which i really like that way we can kind of corner the market on certain things and i think that it gives us an opportunity hey if we need to reach on a certain player because we know he's not going to be around the next time we pick then we pull the trigger on it so i'm excited to see what kind of team we can build here gibbs chase at six Brees halt seven justin jefferson at eight and uh, yeah we're coming up in a couple picks here 
Yep. Yeah, so there are fast and slow drafts for this contest format. The fast drafts are 60 second clocks rather than 30 second clocks that are on most formats now, which gives us even more time. So we're on the clock. AJ Brown, Puka Nakua, Jonathan Taylor, Saquon Barkley, Saquon Barkley, Sam Laporta, and Travis Kelsey there. Who do you like, Andrew, to kick us off? I think I like the ADP choice here. I like AJ Brown going with a wide receiver. He's the top of the ADP. And I think that it does give us an opportunity if we decide to go with a running back, Jonathan Taylor and Saquon Barkley, kind of the next two guys there that we could potentially entertain. So again, kind of being open to, hey, we could do a wide receiver running back start here. And I just know, I feel more confident that, okay, AJ Brown's definitely not going to fall, probably past this guy picking at the the, tw- the the 12 and 13. So let's take AJ Brown now as our stable receiver and see if maybe one of these running backs falls. Yeah, I like that. I wouldn't want to take Jonathan Taylor or Saquon Barkley in the first round. I know that this is a more running back heavy format and we don't want to get left behind at the position. But they just don't feel like first round talents to me. They're guys who have a tricky time taking sometimes at the beginning of the second round normally. But AJ Brown, I'd take him at this range in any kind of draft. So it feels much more comfortable doing that. Um, But yeah, if if Jonathan Taylor, Saquon Barkley come back, I'm fine taking them. Sam Lepore and Travis Kelsey are next up in ADP before you get to Marvin Harrison and Drake London. Do you like either of those guys as Sam Lepore goes off the board and we're back on the clock? I kind of want to see the tight ends play out a little bit here. I I, want to see if maybe we can get some value. I know Mark Andrews is our guy. We love him, even though the the Ravens have a week 14 bye week. Don't love that, but it's it's okay. So I think that we can skip on Kelsey. We saw Laporta here actually go. So I'm cool with skipping on Kelsey, either going with a, a Jonathan Taylor, because this is also where we start to see that tier of very, like, in the second, third round, these receivers are all very, very similar in my eyes, where Jonathan Taylor, I mean, if he recaptures that form before his injuries, can we've not seen him in this Anthony Richardson offense. So, yes, is there maybe a cap when it comes to the amount of receptions? Sure. But uh, we're looking at a guy that scores 15 touchdowns, rushes for over 1,500 yards. I feel pretty good about that. So I, I like JT here. Yeah, I'm, I'm in on Jonathan Taylor. And I think as draft season has gone on, I've kind of, warm to him more and more and it's in part because Jonathan Taylor and Anthony Richardson barely saw the field together I think you know they played something like what like 15 snaps together so try to make a snap judgment on what that's going to look like is pretty tricky but also I think after the injuries that we saw to Anthony Richardson last year I'd be very surprised if they really go all out trying to use Anthony Richardson in the same way when now they've got the running back who they paid plenty of money back on the field. And I think it's going to be a fun offense. I think that we're going to see a lot of rushing touchdowns for the Colts. Maybe it's not, maybe not as many passing touchdowns as we'd like for Anthony Richardson, but yeah, Jonathan Taylor feels like a great pick after us. Saquon Barkley does go the very next pick. So we are midway through round two. And already we've seen seven running backs go off the board with Derrick Henry, the latest to be paired with Brees Hall. It's just a different world to a lot of the best ball sites. And like you say, we both spent a bit of time today making sure we looked at ADP and knew what we were coming into in this contest. We left our best ball cards at the door. We left them at the door. (laughs) We did not bring them in. (laughs) But this this is a big part of like how to approach fantasy knowing the contest you're playing in and knowing what the adp is like nothing ever prepares you for your home league draft because the running backs get pushed up the quarterbacks get pushed back and you're there sitting there going oh man i can't believe i can get this player who i normally would have been able to had to take two rounds earlier at this cost but it's very easy to then end up getting locked out and being like oh, okay my wide receiver room's incredible but it's the fifth round and I'm looking at like the running back 15, 16 already. And yeah, it's uh, understanding where you're drafting is definitely one of the biggest pieces of advice I would ever give to anyone in fantasy. Trey McBride and Travis Kelsey go off the board. Outside of the top tight ends, do you have any particular tight end targets you think could really fit well for this format? It's interesting because you really want to highlight what the tight end premium means in terms of you're getting a a point and a half per reception for these tight ends. So you have to take a step back and look at when you're drafting, especially in the later rounds, when you're looking at some of these more dart throw tight ends. Okay, am I drafting this tight end because I think he can actually rack up a bunch of receptions or 
is he just touchdown dependent? Because that's the Titans you really don't want to gravitate towards because they're not giving you any more advantage. If they're really more a touchdown boomer bust type of player, like I don't know. I don't is Taysom Hill tight end eligible in this format? Do we, is he? Uh, let me look that up. Um, but but yeah, he's exactly the kind of tight tight end that if he was uh, tight end eligible, you don't want to right. chase him. Up it the doesn't help. Yeah, because... he doesn't help you in this particular format because you're not drafting him because he's going to get a bunch of receptions. He's touchdown or like he's boom or bust. So you don't really get yeah, the uh, is... premium from him. He is listed as a quarterback. I okay. believe he was listed as a tight end a couple of years ago, but FFPC changed him back to, sorry, from tight end back to quarterback. Um, <laughs> but he can make up their those, mind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, currently listed as a quarterback on underdog, tight end on DraftKings, tight end on drafters, like understanding where Taysom Hill is listed as a tight end definitely gives you well, an advantage it's, as it's well. It's funny that you bring up his eligibility on DraftKings because it, not the same in all the formats. So he is a quarterback in their September, which is the, the first four weeks. And I was looking, I was like, that's so weird oh, really? that they would change his format or his, uh, his eligibility, you know, on the site within different formats. So when like the daily contest come around, like, I don't know if he's going to be a tight end <laughs> or quarterback on some of those, uh, just like, you know, the weekly millionaires or anything like that. So, I mean, yeah, but again, going back to understanding the format that you're in, like it's really important to understand understand the rules, and we have Scott Fishbowl coming up. Somebody asked me, "Hey, are you taking second overall?" Like, guys, I've been doing so many other things, I've been touching grass. Like, I don't even know exactly what all the rules are, so I got to like cram for that before tomorrow, before the Scott Fishbowl, as we're recording here on a Sunday. Scott Fishbowl, for those who are participating, massive contest, gonna be a ton of fun. I'm in the Shrek division, so one of my favorite guilty pleasure movies. So I'm very excited to be uh, to representing Shrek in this uh, in this big fantasy football tournament. I went with the Dr. Ian Malcolm division purely because I felt like it would have the most gifts or gifs, however you would like to pronounce it. I was like, there are so many that I can drop in at pretty much any point within the draft to express a number of emotions. Uh, as we sit here, Mark Andrews is still on the board, but mm. the rest of the elite tight ends are kind of getting getting gone. Dalton Kincaid goes at the 211 after Kelsey and McBride and Laporte had already gone. First quarterback went off the board in Josh Allen. Typically, QB's not quite pushed up as much in this format as it is in best ball as well, partly because the tight ends and the running backs are pushing ahead of them. But yeah, it feels like where we're at, four picks away, we've got Mark Andrews, Mike Evans, Brandon Ayuk, Cooper Cup, Ma Michael Pittman. Mark, Mark Andrews goes off the board, of course, as I say that, to a drafter who has Brees Hall, Derrick Henry, and now Mark Andrews in a start which there's a lot of potential there it's uh, a powerful looking lineup who stands out to you with us being a couple of pits away well so we do need to identify that the guy at 12 did pick sam port already so we don't necessarily unless he's going to take two tight ends which again if you're going to do that in a format this would be the format to do that in because you can play a tight end and flex so i, I think that we can probably not do tight end at a, at our first pick so it's something to keep in mind there as we're kind of reading the draft board. But I still like Brandon Ayuk a lot, even with all the concerns. He's actually going much later here than in some of the other drafts that I've been in this offseason, some of these best ball drafts. So I think maybe the market here is not as bullish on his just talent, because I think that's kind of what's driving the most of his ADP, because most times when there's ambiguous situations, usually their ADPs decrease. Like there are not as many people trying to draft that player. So I still like Ayuk as a receiver. I don't necessarily love the... Running backs, I mean, Rashad White would be the one guy I would receiver. probably look at, but I, I do like, there's enough good receivers on the board where I feel more comfortable going at the receiver. So I like Ayuk. I enjoy Michael Pittman. Do we want two Colts? That would be my question for you. Especially with people, we have Taylor. If we're kind of investing in him. I feel like we probably would want to fade Pittman because it's like the touchdowns is the play we're trying to make. Yeah. Um, so we are on the clock. I, I like your shout at Brandon Ayuk. I'm not as high on him in general best ball formats, but I like him here. I think that he's got plenty of potential, and I like him more than Mike Evans. I like him more than Cooper Cup. So I'd be happy taking that one. Tight ends dried up. Kyle Pitts went a few picks before his event. Evan Ingram going at the 310 just kind of highlights what the tight end first is here. Like When you look at the tight end position now, 
it really kind of it we hit the, we, we hit the pretty. tight end cliff like it's it's been it's it's gone <laughs> so yeah we... so now you're looking at jake ferguson or george yeah. kittle and i'd rather wait around on them um 100%. so brandon Ayuk, happy yeah. with that yeah let's go with Ayuk. um so then we are what Two picks away from our next one with the team on the turn having Puka Nakua and Sam Laporta. We've got AJ Brown, Jonathan Taylor, and Brandon Ayuk. It feels like we can go in a lot of different ways here. Um, I do like kind of Malik Neighbors, Cooper Cup in this range. I don't mind Rashad White. We could, you know, we could also go a little bit further down and start looking at. Jalen Hurts, if you felt like you wanted to lock in an elite quarterback, we're back on the clock now with 60 seconds to talk it through. But what's standing out to you, Andrew? I'm kind of thinking about what it would like. Again, my, my best ball of mind is trying to come in here. You got to take Devonta Smith, right? Now you have, to, you have two Eagles wide receivers, but we could start them both every single week, which, I mean, that could probably be a ton of points, but I'm not necessarily like super gun ho on that. I do like Rashad White, too, as a running back play there. I don't love... Debo. I don't love Cooper Cup. So I think if we went running back, I think it is clearly white though, would be the play if we did go with a, a running back here. Um yeah, do, do, do you think that because we've seen so many running backs go early that we might get a bit more running back value fall into us a little later on? I think so. And I, I because we're doing this for the first time, I, I kind of want to see us push running back. So let's push running back. So I'm good with either going with uh Devontae Smith or neighbors. Let's go, let's go Devonta Smith. I like the idea of having the two Eagles. I think part of what gets under thought about, that's not very good English coming from an Englishman, um, but some of it gets missed a little bit in redraft is, okay, yes, you've got two players from the same team, which can be a little tricky and present you with occasional problems where one player goes off and the other doesn't give you anything. But we're also looking at, okay, in weeks 15, 16, 17, we need a build that's different to other people because there are going to be hundreds of teams in that final section and we need something to make us stand out. And if the Eagles go into full shootout mode that we know they're capable of and both AJ Brown and Devonta Smith are having massive weeks, then that could be the kind of difference maker that really helps us climb up the leaderboard and get into the big money. Yeah, I, I, I like that. And, I think too, and this is something that my my late grandfather did all the time when Peyton Manning was at the peak of his powers. He just drafted all Colts players. And at the time we used to make fun of him, be like, you can't do this. But then you'd see Peyton Manning throw 45 touchdowns with like 5,000 yards and it worked out. So when you're betting on these explosive offenses like the Eagles, where we're expecting this team is going to run a ton of plays with Kellen Moore coming, calling the shots, We've seen both these guys be very productive. And when one of them gets hurt or goes down or has a down week, you see the other guy absolutely flourish. Like I'd be very interested to go back and look and see how many weekly weeks or what was the top performer for one Eagles receiver every single week. Because during the beginning of the year, nobody was outscoring A.G. Brown except Tyree Kill through the first, I believe it was nine weeks of the season. And then when he kind of fell off a little bit, when he wasn't getting over 125 yards for seven, seven consecutive games, well, you saw Devontae Smith really pick up the slack in the second half of the season, especially when Dallas Goddard missed some time. So it's so clearly, even though we like A.J. Brown as a first-round pick, it's like the closest 1A, 1B type of scenario where both guys would really be, okay, you know, you have Batman and Robin. Well, in this case, it's really, you have Batman and Batman. I think that that's what you're looking at with A.J. Brown and Devontae Smith. So again, we're selling, obviously we made the pick, so we think it's great. But here's to selling it to the listeners that, yes, we drafted two Eagles receivers, but we think it's okay. Yeah, definitely. I just, I think what we've kind of seen from Devonta Smith is that he's probably the best wide receiver too in the NFL on a team. And like, we're talking about a player who's had three consecutive seasons of 100 plus targets, 900 plus yards in each year. That's something which I'm fine hanging my hat on when we're talking about our wide receiver three. Uh, one part of this contest, which is worth touching on in a little more detail, is week six is something that we don't get pretty much in any other format. It's called all play. So rather than matching up against another team within our 12-team division, instead, all the teams just go into an all points format and essentially you want to score as many points as possible in terms of then 
getting awarded points for wins and such like that. I believe it's the top six teams, is it, that week get awarded a win. So scoring really well in week six matters. And so far, we haven't drafted anyone on a week six bye. There are a few teams that are noteworthy who play on week six. The Chiefs, the Rams, Miami, Minnesota. Plenty of firepower in those weeks. How how much would you be wary of drafting multiple players from those teams because of that week six all play format? I think it's probably something that you would use in a tiebreaker scenario. I, I wouldn't be overly concerned because if you're seeing the draft board be very overly concerned about that week six, then maybe you're getting players at a potential value because there are drafters that don't want to overinvest in week six because of this all play format where you can really take advantage of stacking up a win if you just finish in the top half of the total scoring versus in the bottom half, where if you have a lot of players on these teams, then you're just facing an uphill battle and you're going to take a big L during that week when as long as you don't, maybe it's just best to not overinvest. Just like, hey, you know, again, I took my normal amount of players from these teams anyway, even though, again, there are some good teams there, Chiefs, Rams, Dolphins, Vikings. Maybe just make sure you don't draft all those players on the same team. If you're drafting multiple of these FFPC teams in this specific uh, championship format, just keep that in mind. You know, when you're looking at your different types of exposures. And like you said, so far we haven't drafted any of these players, but I'm not going to, Oh my God, we can't draft. We can't draft any chiefs player. We can't draft Rashi rice. Now, let alone his other suspensions and things like that. Who knows about Hitler? He's around in week six. We don't know, but I, I don't think that it's something that you need to be overly concerned about. Again, another, element another layer of your analysis that you want to keep in mind and going back to making sure you understand the format like that's the first question i always ask anybody like what's your league because every league is different and especially with more leagues coming up with these custom formats which i think is a great idea i would say to commissioners just not make it too complicated because then it becomes overwhelming and it's less fun <laughs> but adding in little wrinkles here i'm always a big fan of like the bonuses i i love that like yeah. more points like more points and more flex spots I want to start as many people as possible because then it becomes, becomes closer to best ball format and I make less bad start <laughs> decisions. Because with me, Tom, what happens is my team is too good and I have to bench good players because I get, don't have enough roster spots. So that's my biggest problem. Yeah, I definitely fall victim to that. Like the guys, like I love the running backs in the area of like round on best ball, pick 70 through to 110 this year. I think there's so many good options there. That those are the guys I'm relying on. And in best ball format, you can definitely do that a little easier or on these deeper leagues. And most leagues I play on are much deeper. This isn't too bad. Having two flex as well as two starting running backs, two wide receivers, and a tight end gives us options, and we should have some fun choices to make. Patrick Mahomes goes off the board as the QB2 in round five after Jake Ferguson and George Kill. So now we've seen nine tight ends go off the board. We're probably going to have to allocate some resources to that in terms of looking what's there. But right now, the players who are coming up, we've got Jalen Hurts, which would give us a very powerful Eagles stack, but mean that we're also going to have to draft some depth to kind of cover that possibly later on. Amari Cooper, Kenneth Walker, Christian Kirk, T. Higgins, and Tank Dell, then down to Hollywood Brown, Aaron Jones, Rondre Stevenson. It gets a little less interesting. Maybe we'd want to look at tight end, if not on this pick, then on the next pick. And you'd be kind of looking at David and Joku or possibly possibly looking at maybe Brock Bowers, who is still on the board. I don't know if that interests you, Andrew. Yeah, Brock Bowers is definitely a, a wild card type of selection because it's a, a bet on the talent. I'm not in love with the situation necessarily. And it looks like Jalen Hurts just went off the board, so we don't need to necessarily, we don't have to consider that anymore. Again, it was very extremely tempting when you just line up these offenses. You're like, oh man, here we go. And I don't think that we need to also like look at Dallas Goddard necessarily. I think that's probably overkill, especially with Dallas Goddard yeah. really being a, he benefits the most if one of our receivers gets hurt. And I don't want to necessarily make that hedge type of bet. I'd rather look, hey, we got the two top receivers. Let's just roll with that. Dallas Goddard kind of stays in his beta role. And even though Dallas Goddard is probably one that does also somewhat benefit in this format because he just doesn't have a red zone role since Jalen Hurts has been the quarterback, just never really been a high touchdown scorer, despite the fact that he's been a very consistent tight end. So I, I think for right now, um, 
yeah, Brock Bowers, I think, is really interesting. And uh, David Njoku went as well, or is he still available? Okay, it looks like he's still uh, available. Njoku's so. still there. I think we could push tight end around the corner if yeah. Amari Cooper, Kenneth Walker, Christian Kirk, Tank Dell, Hollywood, any of those guys intrigue you, or anyone else I've not mentioned? I'm pretty good with punting running back. I, if we went running back, it'd probably be Ramondre for me, but I like, I like Cooper. I like Kirk. It's full PPR. Kirk's going to eat in the slot. I feel like he's just like a really or Chris Godwin. I mean, we're getting the buzz. Chris Godwin back in the slot. I like Chris Godwin a lot. I really like Chris Godwin. Yeah, I'd be very happy to take let's Chris go. Godwin. Let's take Godwin. Chris Go Chris Godwin's somebody who as soon as drafts opened, I couldn't understand why he was being drafted so low. He finished the year pretty strong. It was one of those situations where as soon as the season kind of ended and you got the new offensive coordinator in there they were talking about getting him back into the slot more and that's just music to my ears i think chris godwin is such a good slot receiver he's always going to be excellent there and just eat and yeah i know mike evans is great yes you can chalk him up for just about a thousand yards every year but chris godwin just feels like a ppr cheat code um we are back on the clock brock bowers is still here do you fancy taking a tight end him or david and joku or somebody else well, I mean, the thing, the only, so I do like Friar Muth a lot as well. And he goes much later. And I think that he was one of the guys I looked at when I was looking at this earlier on, looking at some of the ADP, he kind of stood out to me as a potential target. But again, there's no reason we can't draft two tight ends too, because of the format. Yeah. And, and Bowers, look, from a projection standpoint, there's not a lot to love about like where he fits in this Raiders offense, but what happens in week one where, okay, he does end up getting a lot of targets and receptions because he becomes Aiden O'Connell's go-to guy or Gardner Minshew. So I, I do think that it is a a risky pick with Brock Bowers here, but I don't love Njoku in this new offense necessarily. So as good as Njoku was last year, I do have question marks if he can return that. So Bowers as it is. Yeah, so I've locked in Bowers there. I think for, like you make a good point about Pat Fryer move, but we can, we can build our tight end room around this you know yes Brock Bowers may take a little bit of time to come on and develop and earn a role but if we pair him with a veteran who we know is going to be out there early on pending injuries or somebody with a fairly easily defined role someone like Pat Fryer move unless Arthur Smith Arthur Smith's us then there's a good chance that he's going to be out there a lot and I think that we can definitely work around that so through six rounds We've got AJ Brown, Jonathan Taylor, Brandon Ayuk, Devonta Smith, Chris Godwin, and Brock Bowers. Remember, if you want to jump into the Fantasy Pros Championship, you can save $20, $25 by using the code Fantasy Pros when you sign up. $350 entry fee. Fast drafts, slow drafts, kicking off all the time throughout the weekend, throughout the week, all the way up until even past the first game. There's live drafts going on in Vegas that weekend and drafts going on online. This biggest redraft contest around, it's going to be a lot of fun and very much one which I'm looking forward to getting into the weeds of. We get $1,000 for our waiver wire budget. You played in this contest last year, Andrew. How aggressive were you with those early bids? I'm aggressive. I, I think that for me, it also makes my life easier <laughs> where if I know I don't have any waiver wire budget left on a certain team, I don't have to keep checking it or I'm making $0 bids. I just think that you should go after what you when you have knowledge about certain teams and players. And that can work both ways. Just because you're being aggressive and you're searching to be aggressive on the waiver wire doesn't mean you just need to blow your uh, waiver wire budget on the first guy that becomes a waiver wire option after week one. I think it just means to be open to going in aggressively, especially if you feel confidently about a certain player, a rookie that breaks out, someone that's now going to see massive opportunity. Like Brock Bowers, again, Maybe I don't know where he's going to be being drafted in some of these home leagues, but you know maybe if he's not drafted in some of these shallower formats, like what he does week one is going to tell a lot. And there's a lot of overreactions to week one as well. So I think that if you're confident, and this is why I think at Fantasy Pros, we do one of the best jobs of putting out waiver wire content, not only really, really fast, like our turnaround time with Fitz and Debro, they are up all night, Sunday night into Monday morning, getting that waiver wire piece out right out of the gates and then recording the show and getting it all good for everyone to watch and listen that's what i do like i'm doing the other things looking at recaps trying to figure out what my waiver wire approach is for that week so for me yeah i think that if you have the knowledge and the statistics to kind of back up being aggressive that's what i like to do because 
you can say, oh, well, I want to hold on to it till the end, but then you can't take it with you. And by the time that you may end up using it, it's like, well, now you're not even in contention anymore because you weren't aggressive from the get-go. So I would rather take a big swing and miss early on and just re kind of recalibrate later on than try to save my waiver funds. I think maybe changes in, again, going back to format, I think that in the guillotine format, which is something that I, I've dabbled in the last couple of years, it's a little bit different because you kind of want to save, you kind of have to save some yeah. so that you don't get knocked out. Cause it's less about finishing first. It's just not finishing in last place. Like essentially that is the name of the game is to not finish in last place on a week to week basis. So that does change the, the strategy. But for me, I like to be aggressive because I think I have, again, if you're a subscriber of fantasy pros, you should feel confident being aggressive. Like you have the knowledge and the backup from the analyst to go in on this guy if you had been hesitant right on Puka Nakua last year, well, you would have missed out. And and even if you didn't pick him up or draft him, you saw that week one go right after him. And, and that's what I did. I, he wasn't drafted in one of my leagues because I, you know, for some reason, I didn't listen to Debro. It, it was a shallow bench league. That's that's my excuse. I didn't have enough bench spots to draft Puka, but I, I watched the shows. I saw how aggressive they were about Puka, and I put in a very, very hefty bid, and I got him. So I was really happy about that. So, yeah, I tend to be on the aggressive side. Yeah, and you know, just even going past Puka, there's loads of examples year over year of guys like James Robinson who aren't drafted, particularly if you're talking 15 round fantasy leagues, even 18 round fantasy leagues. And going aggressive early on, it gives you the most opportunity to get somebody who's going to contribute to your roster consistently. And if they don't, that's fine. There's going to be times as the season goes on, everybody has less budget, so it gets much easier to pay less for players. So, yeah, I'm very much team give our money spent early on and see how you deal with it. Uh, since our last pick, Amari Cooper went off board, Aaron Jones, Tank Dell, which Tank Dell in the sixth round feels fantastic. Yeah. Rashi Rice, Ramondre Stevenson, Keenan Allen, Hollywood Brown, James Conner, Zamir White, and then Christian Watson. How are you feeling when you look at the board so far, Andrew? Again, running backs are going more often than we usually tend to see, just with coming from a lot of best ball drafts, but it makes sense. You can start up to three running backs here, and you only have to start two wide receivers that's that's a big deal and it's also Massive why difference, yeah. it's why when i'm looking back at our team in the brock bauer selection you know i didn't feel like we needed to have one of these running backs that's kind of gone off the board and the right after our pick so i'm interested interested to see because it's always a, a two for two right it's not just oh well you drafted brock bowers you missed it on these players well it's brock bowers and this other player that kind of make that two for two pairing versus what would have been if you had gone with a running back there instead. And then what would have, who would have our tight end have been instead of Brock Bowers? So that's always something to keep in mind when you're looking back at some of these drafts. And yeah, I think Brock Bowers is, like if he's talented as, as the draft capital would suggest, then everyone that watches college football, like we should be, we're excited about that pick, especially where I don't feel like the running back we get pairing with him as our RB2 whenever that ends up coming. I'm not so sure we're going to look and be like, oh man, but we missed out on, Aaron Jones or James Conner or Mondre or Zamir White, I think that we'll probably get a pretty comparable back. But instead of a lesser tight end, we got this massive upside play with Brock Bowers. Yeah, and I think when you look at the draft board, like if you go into any best ball format, and we keep talking about it, but it's so relevant after months of drafting, normally you'll see four, five, zero running back builds. Whereas you look at this and there were very few that by the third round hadn't drafted at least one running back. We've got the team at the 12 spot who started Puka Nakua, Sam Laporta, Mike Evans, Michael Pittman, Christian Kirk, and then taking Kenneth Walker in the sixth round. Outside of that, absolutely everybody had a running back by round five at the very latest the team in the sixth spot had Jamar Chase, Trey McBride, Jalen Waddle, Malik Neighbors, Joe Mixon, and Ramondre Stevenson. So you really can't push it. I've done drafts this year where I haven't taken a running back till round nine, round 10, and I feel completely comfortable with how it's built. But again, Jonathan Taylor here felt like a nice spot because the value we got on Brandon Ayuk and Devonta Smith, Chris Godwin, I like all those players. Brock Bowers, as we said, we might need to pair him with somebody to build around him a little bit. But right now, it feels quite good. We are five picks away. David Montgomery, Jaden Reed, CJ Stroud, Deontay Johnson, Jonathan Brooks, Najee Harris, DeAndre Hopkins, Raheem Mostert, 
Jalen Warren all kind of coming up towards us. So it feels like we're in a good place. There's a lot of guys I like there. Do you feel like we probably want to be looking at running back? We do have four wide receivers now. We do have the tight end. We've got kind of like our late hero running back build. Or are you looking at CJ Stroud and thinking, you know what, this is kind of decent value in the seventh round? Yeah, it is interesting to see CJ Stroud kind of like falling this much like farther than you kind of anticipate. And it's someone that I'm not super high on, but that's usually based on his price. His price is usually much higher than where it is here. So I I still always like pushing quarterback. Again, we've kind of talked about that pushing certain things. We push tight end. We fell out of the elite bucket. So we'll see if that ends up hurting us in the end. But I'm okay with pushing quarterback again. I want to still kind of scoop up some value at some of these other positions. Yeah, I was hoping David Montgomery would have fallen to us there. He goes two picks ahead of us. And David Montgomery in the seventh round feels like a decent RB2 to have alongside Jonathan Taylor. Also gives you a bit of leverage against the guy who drafted Jameer Gibbs at the five spot. You're saying, okay, well, actually, if David Montgomery smashes for me, there's a good chance it's at your detriment. We are back on the clock. Uh, Najee Harris goes one pick before us. So we're looking at CJ Stroud, DeAndre Hopkins, Raheem Mostert, Jalen Warren, who I can't stop drafting, and then Dallas Goddard, Zach Moss, Tony Pollard. What stands out to you, Andrew? It's not that you can't stop drafting him. It's we, the the royal we. You are over the, the across the pond again. We got to talk royalty here. Yes, we're drafting Jalen Warren. I think it's it's so poetic that he goes right after him and Najee Harris are always kissing each other in the ADP. They're always right next to each other, and I just never want to take Jalen not Warren over Najee, even though that's how I feel. And it's just like, all right, all right Najee went. All right, now time to draft Jalen Warren. So yeah, I think especially in, it's full PPR and. For Jalen Warren, like the one thing Arthur Smith showed that he could do last year was target the running back in the passing game. <laughs> so even if he is a total clown again, he's still going to get targets for Jalen Warren because that's the preferred pass catcher. So Jalen Warren, especially because the other guy's going to take a probably take a running back here as well. So yeah, and Jalen Warren, I mean, he's playing with two quarterbacks who led the league in check down rate when kept clean last year russell wilson led the league at like a 19 percent rate justin fields wasn't too far behind at 13 percent and part of that's schematic but part of it is just quarterbacks just dumping the ball off and i think jalen warren's gonna absolutely thrive under arthur smith and with those quarterbacks at the helm zach moss does go as you said that draft that does take another running back so we could take another running back in kind of raheem moster tony pollard Taji Spears, we could reach down a bit and get Pat Fryer move, or otherwise it's kind of CJ Stroud, Dak Prescott, Joe Burrow. What do you like, Andrew? So when I was doing this earlier, when I was kind of looking at some of these ADPs, so I do think Fryermuth is kind of interesting here. I don't really want to go after Hawkinson and deal with having to roster him for this long, especially where he's going. Like I, I this is too expensive for me given he's yeah. maybe not coming back till the end of October. The one guy. Again, another guy that we were looking at, I was loving over the 4th of July weekend, Brian Robinson. I, I think that he's kind of undervalued here. So if we, if we went running back, I actually like Brian Robinson a lot here. That would be my pick. But if it's not him, I do like Fryermuth. Well, Jalen Warren is my top drafted player in best ball. And well, all the formats I've played so far this off season, Brian Robinson is right, but they're behind him. And I love that pick. Um, for me, slightly more than the double stealers pick with Pat Fryer move. Uh, so I'm good with Brian Robinson. If you are, let's do it. Like for me, it's Brian Robinson gives you that hedge against Austin Eckler because he's coming off career lows in a bunch of tackle, a uh, bunch of categories that matter things like missed tackles forced as well as, just generally looking slow. I don't think that Jaden Daniels is going to check down the ball to the running backs as much as Justin Herbert did. And I think that the no huddle offense, which Cliff Kingsbury deploys, is going to keep the early down running back, Brian Robinson, on the field a lot. And Cliff Kingsbury always designed a pretty good running back game. So yeah, I'm happy to keep drafting Brian Robinson. We did take him... 13 picks past Austin Eckler in this one. And I don't like drafting Austin Eckler when he's costing you a pick around pick 100 in best ball. I definitely wouldn't like drafting him here as the RB2 on the team out of the 101. They had CD Lamb, Isaiah Pacheco, Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, George Kittle, Christian Watson, which all feels pretty nice. And then Austin Eckler is RB2. Maybe I'm completely wrong on Austin Eckler. Maybe he 
does dominate and is good this year. But it wasn't like the commanders went out and signed him immediately, he sat around on free agency market for a good few days and signed a deal. I think it was around $4 million. It definitely wasn't a lot of money. I just can't get behind the Austin Eckler love. Like Maybe it's the injury thing and people are looking past that because he definitely was injured last year. There's no doubt about that. He was playing extremely banged up, but everything that he said during the offseason, he's been begging the Chargers the last couple of years to take touches off of him, and they never did, and he got worn down as a result. He's already talking about how he doesn't want to have so many carries. He's about- literally the only player in the NFL <laughs> who wants fewer touches. Every other player comes off the field and says, I need more touches. Why aren't they getting me the ball? But every offseason, we heard it. It was one of the running backs behind me needs to step up and take more touches. They've got to do more. They've got to do more. But like, give, give me that alpha mentality over that. Like, I, I can't be spending a seventh round pick on a guy who doesn't want to touch the ball as much as possible. Yeah, and I think that maybe I said this on a different show, but I think there's going to be some sticker shock when it comes to Eckler and where he's going in best ball drafts and where he's going to actually go in redraft leagues because of the name Cache. Like Austin Eckler was a top five pick last year, and now he's going in round seven. And in best ball drafts, he sometimes goes outside the top 100. Like he's in the RB30 range. That's not going to fly in these ESPN Yahoo leagues that you're drafting sleeper leagues. He's going to be going, especially sleeper. Like Austin Eckler is like, we love him on sleeper. Like he's a, and he's a big fantasy football guy, like a fantasy football advocate. Yeah. So I think that his ADP is going to cons- like, is going to pretty much consistently always be in front of Brian Robinson, even though the latest report that we saw from the athletic was we'll see how much Austin Eckler eats into Brian Robinson's carries and workload. Like that's, that's how we need to be viewing the situation. It's not Eckler's the starter and Brian Robinson is the two down grinder back. Maybe he gets the red zone. It's, okay, is Eckler spelling Brian Robinson on third downs and in pass pro? Which, yeah, that's probably going to happen, but that's okay. Like, we're not drafting Brian Robinson because he has this massive reception ceiling. We don't expect that, especially with a mobile quarterback. That's the other thing I can't wrap my mind around, where Jane Daniels yeah. is not going to check the ball down. That's Austin Eckler's best attribute that he can offer at this time is as a pass catcher out of the backfield, but he has a mobile quarterback. We saw that one game. I think with Tyrod Taylor a couple of years ago and Eckler had like zero targets in that specific contest and everyone was freaking out because, Oh my God, like what's going to happen to Eckler. And then again, chargers charge as they always do. They stabbed Tyrod Taylor in the lung and Justin Herbert got to start and play games. <laughs> so it worked out for Eckler in the <laughs> long run, but the the touchdowns are going to go through Brian Robinson. We saw this when it was Melvin Gordon and Austin Eckler under Anthony Lynn. That's the guy who's in Washington now as the run game coordinator. Anthony Lynn likes doesn't like to feature Eckler as their red zone back. So yeah, Brian Robinson to me, I think that it's it's a layup over Eckler. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you go back to even before the NFL Combine, Matthew Berry's things I've heard at the NFL Combine article, which is always good. There's always good nuggets in there. He talked about how much the commanders were effusive about Brian Robinson there. And he was a little surprised when they ended up going out and signing Austin Eckler. But I don't think the two things are completely you know, they don't mean something all the time. You know, they could be really high on Brian Robinson, but they saw a veteran running back who can come in and be a positive influence in the dressing room, which they're trying to create a culture there. This is a new coaching staff for $4 million. And the commanders weren't a team who were particularly cash strapped. So I absolutely get it. I think it's fine. Um, We are five picks away since Brian Robinson went off the board. CJ Stroud did go one pick later, so the 803, that feels like nice value where I'd be very comfortable taking CJ Stroud. Dallas Goddard does go after him. Then we start to see some more running backs going off in Blake Corum, Tony Pollard, Raheem Mostert. Pat Frymuth and TJ Hawkinson go off the board. Jaden Daniels. Our first defense goes off at the 901. Here's to that. Defense off the board. (laughs) Yeah. So that is the New York Jets off the board at the 901. What is the earliest you would have considered taking a defense? <laughs> Not for another three rounds, four rounds. The Jets play the 49ers week one. It's not even a good matchup week one. So uh, again, I'm I'm never going to invest this highly in a defense because it's so matchup driven. And we'll talk about defense that we're looking at when that time comes. So again, we got time, folks. If you need to use the bathroom in between, don't worry. You're not going to miss us drafting a defense anytime soon. So yeah, I'm going to be, I'm going to be waiting much longer, especially I'm glad. I'm just glad it wasn't a kicker first. 
At least it was a defense. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I think there's definitely a little bit of hate ends up on the defense and kicker leagues these days. I like it in limits. Most of my dynasty leagues, I don't believe that defense or kicker belong. I always, in I always just cut I mean, them. I always just cut them and yeah. add them right before the season starts again. <laughs> And in traditional best ball, I don't enjoy having kicker or defense in there because you just end up having to allocate too many picks towards them. But in redraft, I don't mind it. My home league still has defense and kicker. I don't think we'll ever get rid of it because the commish is a big, big fan of both positions. We are two picks away. At the top of the board, we're looking at Jordan Love, Javante Williams, oh, Kyler Murray, Roma I Dunze, Devin Singletary, Trey Benson... No, I'm not even going to say this other guy's name because he's injured and won't play for ages. But Brian Thomas, <laughs> Dalton Schultz, Jerome Ford, what what are you? What's standing out to you? I think it's Kyler. I I, I mean Kyler, Kyler Murray. Uh, I mean, yeah, our, the guy behind us doesn't have a quarterback yet, so we can't risk losing out on Kyler. But we we thought about C.J. Stroud last round, and again, I did think that he could probably could have been good value here. But now we can compare Brian Robinson with. Kyler Murray, who unless this guy doubles down at CJ Stroud and Kyler Murray, I think that Murray should fall to us here. And look, we saw someone already take Jane Daniels. So that's someone I'm I'm always tabbing Jane Daniels as my lay around quarterback that I want. But in this exercise, in this draft, somebody wanted him more and they took him ahead of ahead of us. So I'm okay with that. Give me Kyler Murray. He's he's the guy that we're hoping Jane Daniels has a rookie year like Kyler Murray did, <laughs> where he's leading the NFL in rushing attempts per game as a rookie quarterback and wins offensive rookie of the year. So Kyler Murray removed from the ACL ACL injury another year. He was productive last year. I, that was one of the things I was so wrong about. I, I was, oh yeah, massively. I, I thought Murray right. was going to come back and struggle and not run. And right after the first game, I was like well, like he looks fine. <laughs> like he is running around. He's yeah. doing his thing. And all they've done is just give him weapons so he can actually be productive. <laughs> so I think Colin Murray's slam dunk here. Yeah. And like you said, he was rushing for over 30 yards per game. He was rushing over five attempts per game. And both of them are kind of metrics. But when I've looked at what makes dual threat quarterbacks really elite, it's rushing in that kind of range. Like when you look at the quarterback performances where they've scored over 30 points. It nearly always correlates to like basically two thirds of those come back to quarterbacks who've rushed for 38 yards or more. And when you look at top 10 quarterbacks at the end of the year, about half of them end up rushing for at least five rush attempts per game. So those are two metrics I kind of always look out for. And I think that Kyler Murray, like you say, a year further removed from the ACL, actually getting to have an off season in this new offense rather than being injured with Marvin Harrison, with Michael Wilson in his second year, with Trey McBride not having to sit behind Zach Ertz to start the year. Absolute wheels up. I think Kyler Murray can be a top four quarterback this year and getting him at the end of round nine is great. We've got one pick. We are back on the clock now. So I like Roma Dunze here, but I also feel like maybe... Maybe we need more running backs and Devin Singletary, Dalton Schultz is there, Jerome Ford, Gus Edwards. Where are you leaning, Andrew? To me, we're we're in such a, a jag territory of running backs. I, I get that Singletary <laughs> is getting the volume, but we're not going to start him over Taylor or Warren or Robinson if those guys are healthy. So I think that it's Rome. We're getting a top 10 drafted wide receiver in the real NFL draft outside the top 100. I mean, and, and I think that's, we don't have to start him week one. So we can see how things kind of play out with Roma Dunze where, oh, Keenan Allen pulled his hamstring again. Oh, DJ Moore, not seeing the volume we wanted to see from last year. He's facing more target for competition or comp, uh, competition for targets. So Roma Dunze to me, he is such a, just the market's out on him. Like he's just going so yeah. late in drafts because everyone is so afraid of the target competition where it's like, well, if he's really good, then it shouldn't matter. And where you're placing your bet on a player that the NFL deemed so talented to take inside the top 10 overall, I think it's just a no brainer. I mean, are we, I can't imagine like looking up and saying, okay, yeah, we took Devin Singletary over Roman, Roman Dunze. I, I just can't, I could not live with myself. And I get from a structure standpoint, it can make sense to take the running back over the receiver. I get that. But eventually in this fantasy football game that we play, 
we have to consider the talent of the player. And I think for me, Rome just checks off all the boxes, especially where we don't need him to produce from day one because of the guys we have in front of him. I just think that he's a home run. Yeah, like I kind of go back to the draft, and I think obviously if he was drafted to the Chargers at six, people would be taking him much higher right mm. now. You'd be looking at that Malik Neighbors range in round four. But even if he'd gone to the Tennessee Titans, I think you're talking like a two, three round bump. We've seen time and time again that rookies can come in and they can outperform situations. And I love Keenan Allen. I quite like DJ Moore, but not particularly at his price. But I still think that by the time that things really matter, Roma Dunze is going to be a very important player down the stretch. We know Caleb Williams and him seem to have hit it off. They've got a report together. I think that that's going to be very beneficial to him. And I just think this Bears offense in general is one that I want to be quite high on this year. Um, there's obviously a lot of ways it could play out. But you know what? That's kind of a beautiful thing about sports. And the other great thing about sports, there's only two days the whole year without a game. So with so much happening, so much action, that makes just about every day, game day at DraftKings Sportsbook. Super easy for first timers to get started. Try betting on something simple like picking a team to go win. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, select your team, place your first bet. It really couldn't be any easier or simpler. Baseball, golf, UFC, NFL, there's something for every fan of every sport to bet on. And yes, it is July 7th and we're sitting here drafting a team. Football season will be here before you know it. Before we jumped on, I was looking at Super Bowl bets. That's the big one, the one that everybody kind of wants to focus on and see where their team is. Two teams stood out to me. Bengals at 1,300 and then the Eagles at 1,700. But we've made a large, <laughs> a large bet on in this roster. I think they're both two teams who've been to the dance, couldn't quite get it done. Both got quarterbacks bouncing back from injuries. If you're looking outside of the top favorites, I like both of them. And if you're new to DraftKings, you've got to check this out. You'll get a $5 bet. New customers bet $5 and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code FANTASYPROS. That's code FANTASYPROS for new customers to get $150 in bonus bets instantly when you bet just $5. Only on DraftKings. The crown is yours. Round 10. In the books, Brock Purdy goes off as the second quarterback for the team out of a 101, who now has CeeDee Lamb, Isaiah Pacheco, Josh Allen, Stefan Diggs, George Kittle, Christian Watson, Austin Eckler, Jordan Addison, the New York Jets defense, and Brock Purdy. Do you ever end up kind of like zigging when <laughs> other teams are zagging like that? Like that's not something I would normally do in redraft, but I think sometimes redraft, you've kind of got to throw the plan out like my home league has been won by an auto drafter before there's <laughs> all these kind of situations where things get a bit weird and funky do you ever just go you know what i'm not gonna take the approach i would normally do i'm just gonna do what i'd like to i i think that there's merit to that and to zigging when other people zag but i think that you're trying to do that to achieve some type of goal where you're trying to get value at certain position. You're trying to have a strength maybe where other people are all weak. So I guess his scenario here is I want to have the best quarterback room. Okay, you can start one quarterback here in this format. And there's the waiver wire. Again, we were talking about this before we started or at the beginning of the show. I have was in this contest last year with a couple different teams. CJ Stroud was somebody I got off the waivers. Like he was not drafted. So that's something you got to keep in mind that Again, coming from our best ball backgrounds, drafting, everyone is drafting two or three quarterbacks. That's not necessarily the case here. You don't have to draft two quarterbacks here because you have access to the waiver wire. Again, we have talked at nauseum about best ball strategy and this and that, but best ball used to just be, oh, your lineup just starts automatically for you. That's used to be really the main difference of what best ball was. And then it's become this whole other thing by itself with the strategy and the roster construction. But it used to just be, oh, this receiver is better in best ball because you can't predict when he's going to have his good games. <laughs> like that was really the, like the identity of best ball and it's evolved so much, which is really fun. But the other part of it that's different and there are best ball leagues that do have the waiver wire, but most of them don't. And that's why you have to draft the full team knowing that I don't have access to the waiver wire. And that's why wide receivers are so important in best ball is because you can't get, it's so hard to, to get receivers that are actually good off the waiver wire. Whereas at the other positions, quarterback, tight end, running back, you'll find every single year 
that pool of players is much richer in the waiver wire pool versus the wide receiver. Now, again, Puka Nukua was a standout last year. There are some receivers that pop up here and there, but for the most part, that's the hardest position to replace on the waiver wire, which is why in best ball, you have to draft the most of them. So, and I think that's something we can keep in mind here too. In best ball, we would be like, right, let's load up on more wide receivers. We have four, we have five receivers. We can get more. Well, they're just bench guys now. And we have to then figure out when to start these guys. So that's hard to do as analysts week to week basis that changes. So, I'm thinking now as we're kind of approaching this, you're starting to see this little bit of running back run here. Um, I like looking at running backs here that have contingent upside that we're going to have on our bench. Yeah, definitely. And that's it. You know, we've got 20 rounds. Obviously, we need to look at depth at a certain point. We are back on the clock now. The guys around where we're being drafted, Luke Musgraves right there. I think he's an interesting option at tight end, or we could look at Hunter Henry if we want to pair Brock Bowers with another tight end. We could push it around the corner. There's Gus Edwards, Khalil Shakir, Romeo Dubs, Josh Palmer, Jared Goff, Jerry Judy, Mike Williams, Rico Dowdall, Brandon Cooks, Caleb Williams, Rashid Shahid. What's standing out to you, Andrew? I do like Hunter Henry, but I think we can push him around the corner just because we know the other guy has Sam Laporta, so I'm not super concerned about overly drafting Hunter. He's also pretty low on the the ADP, so I think that we can snag Henry on the next pick. But yeah, I wanted Kendra Miller. He went one pick before us, so I'm not in love with any of these running backs. So I'm cool with drafting another receiver. I, I like Josh Palmer. I don't think we need to go with Gus Edwards or anybody like that. So Josh Palmer, I think, is a fine pick. If you like really like Musgrave, I'm cool with that too. No, I'm good with that. I like Josh Palmer. I think Josh Palmer is somebody who is interesting for this build because we're saying we know we might not get much out of Roma Dunsey till possibly quite late in the season. You know, you go back and look at like Jamar Chase or Justin Jefferson. They weren't guys who really hit the ground and were just incredible from day one. So I'm okay saying we might need a little bit more wide receiver depth to carry us. I do like Luke Musgrave slightly more than Hunter Henry, but if one of those tight ends make it back to us, I'd be pretty pleased knowing that we've got a day one starter and that they're likely to play a lot of snaps, and I'd feel pretty pleased with that. Um, in terms of those two tight ends, do you have a strong lean between Musgrave or Hunter Henry? I so my the thing with Musgrave is I just really like Tucker Craft. And I think it's it's yeah. just a player take that I have. And I could be wrong, but I like to think that I'm more right than I'm wrong. So I, I think that Tucker Craft could end up winning the job. But we are in a scenario where if we take Musgrave here, Craft is pretty much free at the end of the draft. So there's no reason we can't just take both guys and see how it shakes out in come week one. And then, and then we have the Green Bay because we want the Green Bay Packers starting tight end. I don't really care who it is. So if that's cool with you, if we take a stab on craft, maybe later in the draft, because he's also someone that we know, okay, if he has no role week one, he's the first guy we cut and it's Musgrave's role. So we know we have that information. So um, I do like Henry more in a, a vacuum, but if we play it where we can get both Packers tight ends, uh, I'll give the green light to Luke Musgrave. Well, Rico Dowell goes after Gus Edwards. So I'll be honest, I'm quite happy to take Hunter Henry here and we can get into that afterwards. But like for me, Maybe Hunter Henry makes the most sense because Brock Bowers, we're looking for somebody who we can get guaranteed production out and is going to be on the field. And much as I do like Luke Musgrave, I do think your point on Tucker Craft is really good. And maybe it becomes tricky for us to definitely get Tucker Craft at a point. And I'd hate to end up having to reach on our tight end three. So I'm good with um, Hunter Henry if you are. Yeah. I think when you, look, when you look at what Tucker Craft did down the stretch last year. I mean, really, it was just like the Green Bay tight end wasn't particularly valuable up until Tucker Craft got on the field because weeks 1 to 11, Luke Musgrave was out there playing 70% of snaps. They had a 14% target share, and Tucker Craft was playing like 30% of snaps. It was, it was miserable. Like the two of them were combining for nine PPR points per week. And then when Luke Musgrave suffered the lacerated kidney and was went on injured reserve, at that point you saw Kraft get on the field, but it also kind of coincided with Jordan Love becoming really good. Like Kraft played 93% of snaps, averaged 10.5 PPR points per game, which would be even more in this format. He was the tight end 11 from that point to the end of the season. And if it wasn't for Tucker Kraft getting injured and not being 
uh, full go for OTAs, I think I'd have drafted quite a bit of him over the last couple of months. So I do like Luke Musgrave because I think we play slightly different roles and it's on Green Bay to try and get them both on the field. And I think that they're creative enough that they can probably do that. But it's also difficult because, you know, you go down to like even the wide receiver four in Green Bay and we like pretty much all the options they have. So maybe Hunter Henry made the most sense with Brock Bowers, but in a vacuum with, say, if we'd got Mark Andrews or, you know, Jake Ferguson, maybe I would have pushed harder for Luke Musgrave. No, I like that analysis. I think with Hunter Henry in particular, because I, I agree with everything you said about Kraft. It's the reason why I just like Kraft more than Musgrave. The correlation is there. The, once Kraft started getting the lineup, the Packers' offense was good. <laughs> so that's all I'm gonna. That's all I'm gonna take credit for. And so that's that happened. That's clearly the reason why the offense turned into good. It wasn't that he just happened to also be on the field when the offense started to finally turn the corner, <laughs> and he just benefited from the offense being better overall. But with Henry, this is why I mentioned earlier, kind of being slightly hesitant on Njoku, where it's a whole new offensive ecosystem there. Again, it is still the same head coach, but. Alex Van Pelt is gone and he's in New England. Like this is a super friendly tight end offense that loves to get tight ends involved in the red zone. And what has Hunter Henry done ever since he got to New England is just catch touchdowns. Like that's all he's done. Even in seasons where he's been bad, the offense has been bad. He's been the touchdown guy. And now he's in a situation where, I mean, he's a dark horse to lead this team in targets. Where are we getting a tight end in round 12 in tight end premium that, actually has a legitimate shot of leading their team in targets because what if these rookies are just not that good, especially in the beginning of the year, like where you said, it's so key to pair him with a guy like Brock Bauer. I think this is the ideal way to play it actually. So if you draft Brock Bowers draft Hunter Henry, like this is like the tight end pairing that you want going into the season, whether it's in the FFPC draft, whether it's in a normal redraft league, because I I don't think that I could just draft Brock Bowers as my tight end one and then just go right into it and start him week one. I think it's fair, especially what we'll get. Hopefully the preseason gives us a little bit enough idea of like, okay, we know he's starting. We know he's operating out of the slot because Luke Getze has a lot of work to do to kind of figure out where to put all these guys. And the guy that took the defense took the kicker off the board. <laughs> sorry, I just, I just, I'm sorry, it broke, it broke the bit. But Hunter Henry, yes, I think it's a, a great pick. And then he drafted a fullback. So, so there we go. <laughs> so, all right, <laughs> throwing it back to you, Tom. No, I, I think, well, we can come back to Benson. I, I definitely want to touch on that. But um, Hunter Henry and this this method that I was just kind of talking about and then you've expanded upon, thinking about how you pair players together and thinking about how you construct a lineup, I think it's such a big edge that's going to take your fantasy football approach from you're going to do well to this is how you win leagues by going, okay, well, if I want to draft Jonathan Brooks, which running back am I pairing that I'm saying, okay, I can count on his production whilst Jonathan Brooks perhaps isn't out there. And it's particularly relevant with rookies. We know that they are going to come on stronger across the rest of the season. And being able to pair rookies with veterans who have assured starts to the year, you know, and whether it's a guy who struggles with injury, maybe not as much as a guy like J.K. Dobbins saying, okay, well, I'll pair him with Jonathan Brooks. But finding ways to just build your roster and say this might be a little shaky but i can build in some upside by doing this it's it's absolutely worth doing every year but yeah so the dallas defense goes in the 13th round but a couple of picks before that ben snot goes i'm I'm picking up slightly that you're not quite as high on him as uh perhaps the guy who drafted him at the 13th round one at 1301 i i am not like Sanat. i i get that he had a good pro- prospect profile. I know that Debro really likes him a lot, but I am terrified that he's going to get the Trey McBride treatment in Cliff Kingsbury's offense. And he's sitting behind Zach Ertz because the reason is he and Zach Ertz can play in the offense at the same time, except the issue is Ben Sinat is now playing a fullback role. Like they've compared him a lot. Again, this 49ers offense, not as much to George Kittle, but more to Kyle Juszczyk. And that terrifies me as someone if you're drafting Ben Sinat, hoping that he is going to be a fantasy contributor from day one. So I think that his preseason usage will be telling. But I do think this is a case of last year, it was Greg Dulcich, where it was so clear after the preseason games that, oh, this guy is buried behind Adam Troutman. Like You cannot draft this guy. And he got injured, so it didn't really end up making a difference. But 
I am very hesitant to push the button on Ben Sanat right now because I think that in year one, again, last year, we saw tight ends produce at a very high level as rookies. That's really hard to replicate. And especially from a guy that wasn't a first round or top second round pick. So I would just be pumping the brakes on Ben Sanat. And I mean, this guy has George Kittle, right? So you're starting George Kittle. I, I, I'm just punting tight end. If I have George Kittle, I'm just going to take the booms with the bus weeks because I don't know if there's ever going to be a game where Ben Sanat's going to ever have a higher ceiling than George Kittle. And yes, they may offer both uh, bad floors, but yeah, I have my trouble wrapping my mind, wrapping my mind around uh, this Sanat pick. Yeah, I mean, you go back since, what, the year 2000, there's been 384 different tight ends who have recorded a stat fantasy worthy in the nfl and only two of them have scored over 10 points in the rookie season 43 percent of rookie tight ends have scored less than two points per game like it's just it's a really difficult position to nail we are one pick away team starting to take their second quarterbacks i don't know about you but i'm kind of okay pushing that for me, looking at the guys at the top of the queue, it's Rashid Shaheed, Chuba Hubbard, Tyler Algier, Elijah Mitchell, Jahan Dotson, A.D. Mitchell, Adam Phelan, Bucky Irving. I quite like a couple of the running backs. I quite like Tyler Algier. I don't mind Elijah Mitchell in this format or even Bucky Irving. What stands out to you, Andrew? I like Algier. I think that he, again, he's a injury contingent guy for the most part, or at least that's what we think but we could be wrong how they deploy their running backs as a new offense. So, but Algier is good. Like we know he's good. He was good as a rookie and he had the most unlucky situation put into last year where they trapped the B. John Robinson, but on a lot of other back up, oh, go ahead. Is there a better RB two in the NFL? I, I mean, we're, 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 I mean, Blake, when did Blake Corm get drafted? He got drafted in round eight. What's the difference between him and Tyler Algier? <laughs> Except Algier's already done at the NFL level. So, yeah. And, yeah, and I mean, I've got more faith in the Falcons being good this year than yeah. Blake Corum managing to get on the field. So, yeah, uh, I'm happy taking Tyler Algier. I think that if Bijan Robinson hadn't been drafted by the Falcons when they absolutely didn't need to, Tyler Algier would be a guy that we'd be taking in the top three rounds like last year and this year. And I think that would be a fine bet. So again, I like the running back room we're building out. We've got Jonathan Taylor, Jalen Warren, Brian Robinson, and Tyler Algier. I'll recap the full team in a moment, but we are one pick away from our 14th round pick. Obviously defense and kicker is going to start to come into play in the next few rounds but I don't know if we need to do that. If we wanted another quarterback, it's guys like Deshaun Watson, Aaron Rodgers, Baker Mayfield, Geno Smith, Will Levis. I'm comfortable pushing that a bit further. We are on the clock now. Yeah, I'd Who do you it. like here, Andrew? Um, I mean, it'd be interesting to, to pair, to draft not only Algier, but Elijah Mitchell and just bet against McCaffrey and Bijan because we didn't we didn't get them. So it's, it's like, let's just bet against them not firing or getting injured one of those scenarios. And then... What, how do we benefit the most from that chaos? Have their direct backups. So I do like Elijah Mitchell. I think that he's going to be healthier this year. And the only other running back I like a lot is is Roshan, who I've just talked. I always talk about Roshan. I just think he's awesome because I think Swift is this year's Miles Sanders. <laughs> so uh, those will be my top two running back picks. Yeah, so Roshan falls a little bit at times. So let's let's take Elijah Mitchell. Uh, I think that Mitchell in general is somebody I want because it's so clear for him. Whereas Roshan, there could be a little bit of the Khalil Herbert situation that bleeds into it, and it could be a little tricky at times. But mm. um, when you talk about Elijah Mitchell, you go back to various points last year when Niners beat reporters would ask Kyle Shanahan. What does this guy have to do to get on the field? What does this guy have to do to get on the field ahead of Elijah Mitchell? And Shanahan would just completely just disregard it. And, you know, in the way that only Shanahan does and be like, Elijah Mitchell's the RB too. That's all that matters. And so Christian McCaffrey, what well, he's heading into his age 29 season, he's been remarkably healthy since he got traded from the Carolina Panthers for a guy who'd struggled before that. I'm not wishing injury on CMC. I'm not even trying to predict injury because the moment you do that, it's difficult. But when we're talking about running backs, 
sooner or later they are going to miss time that's just a fact like you know virtually all of them do and having elijah mitchell and tyler algier two clear rb2s when we're talking about our rb4 and our rb5 that just feels like a good build to me i agree and this goes back to the difference between best ball and roster management we don't have to worry about whether we have to start algier mitchell we know we're not starting them but the minute that there's an injury oh Who's starting the RB2 slot? Tyler Algier, Elijah Mitchell. Like there is a benefit to having a peace of mind of a roster that you don't have to necessarily make 12,000 different start sit decisions every single week. Like that takes a toll on you, especially with so many people playing in so many different leagues. So I like having that on the bench because now we have Jonathan Taylor. He is our hero RB. He's locked in every single week. And then we're mixing up between Jalen Warren and Brian Robinson. Oh, who do we like the matchup this week? Whose usage is trending in the right direction? Okay, that's our RB2. And then Algier and Mitchell are there for us when we need them. And if there's an injury that happens, and this is something that I keep pointing out on a lot of the shows, again, going back to not trying to project injuries, but the two healthiest offenses last year were the Atlanta Falcons and the San Francisco 49ers. So it that's just not going to happen again. That's just not how injuries work year over year. It's going to regress. And if you're going to push your chips on, okay, so this team suffers more injuries, well, what position do you think that would be at? It's probably going to be at running back. So, again, I would be very shocked if we're looking at this and we're not going to get any startable weeks out of Algier or Elijah Mitchell. We're going to get all 17 games played between McCaffrey and Bijan. I don't think that's going to happen. So I love the upside that we're putting on our bench here. Yep. Yeah, so we're heading into round 15. We've seen two kickers go so far, Brandon Aubrey and then Harrison Butker went in the 14th round. Only one team has, sorry, only two teams has a defense so far. We have saw the Jets going round nine and then the team picking out the three slot as the Dallas defense in round 13 paired it with the Baltimore Ravens in round 14, which again, I just, I'm not a fan of using two spots on the onesie positions, particularly if you're going to double down on it in such quick succession. Our team through 14 rounds is AJ Brown, Jonathan Taylor, Brandon Ayuk, Devonta Smith, Chris Godwin, Brock Bowers, Jalen Warren, Brian Robinson, Kyler Murray, Roma Dunze, Joshua Palmer, Hunter Henry, Tyler Algier, and Elijah Mitchell. How are you feeling, Andrew? I really like the pick. I I, I really like the team, honestly. <laughs> I I think that it does come down to what Bowers, I, I think Bowers being a hit that knocks his team out of the park if he really can hit in this Raiders offense. Cause that's the only pick I'm just not a hundred percent sure about, but it's a bet on a rookie that was drafted really highly. That's the bet that we're making. And like you said earlier in the show, this is part of the fun. Like we don't know what's going to happen. If we did, it wouldn't be any fun to play fantasy football. So you got to take some risks here and there with some players that you're excited about. So again, I haven't been drafting a ton of, I think a lot of Bowers in dynasty, but I do find that the discrepancy between his, redraft ADP versus a guy that's the consensus 104 in a lot of different dynasty formats, one quarterback formats. I did some research looking back at like dynasty league football ADP, and he's one of the cheapest 104s that we've ever seen. So you're seeing that the dynasty community is so, so sure that this guy's going to hit and then redraft is, Oh, well he's on the Raiders. Like the situation is really bad. But again, we've seen situations change really quickly. Is Jacoby Myers as good as he was last year? What is, is Devonta Adams on the team throughout the entire season? If he gets disgruntled here and there, we don't know. So I, I think that it's definitely worth the upside, especially in this format to take a guy like a, like a Brock Bowers. But overall, I'm happy with the team. I think that I like our running backs that we're getting pairing with our hero RB approach. I love the receivers. And I think Kyler Murray is a great quarterback that you alluded to could be a top five guy that we got in round nine. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's a fun build. We are going to have to start thinking about upside picks, maybe players who want to scroll a bit further down and see whether they could earn a bigger role through training camp. Each week, we're going to be back here talking rises and fallers when we're not in drafts. We're going to talk about the players that you should be taking shots on. So definitely make sure you're going to be checking us out each and every week. And I think that's a good way to play redraft, particularly if you're drafting early like we are. You want to take guys and don't get stuck to them. Be prepared with the idea that, okay, I can drop this guy. 
if I hear about a guy like James Robinson, if I start hearing these reports about a player like Kyron Williams, who is actually the clear RB1 in a backfield, I need to be aggressive and pursue that. We are two picks away. At the top is your boy Roshan Johnson, then Jermaine Burton, Quentin Johnson, Chigozia McConquo, Khalil Herbert, Damian Pierce, Jalen Polk, and then we get down to the Niners defense and a few more running backs, and then the greatest kicker of all time, Justin Tucker. Justin Tucker is tempting. Just to lock, <laughs> lock up that kicker spot. Um, I hope Roshan... Oh, okay, Roshan, of course, comes off the board there. Of course. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> <laughs> yep so Clyde Edwards lair goes off and we are back on the clock what, what are you feeling like for me it's quite open did you have any interest yeah. in Foreman as someone that can maybe I, be productive early on I do yeah I think we've got a running back room of Jalen Warren and Brian Robinson obviously so taking someone like Don to Foreman he could give us some kind of guaranteed touches whilst those situations shake out. Um, obviously, Brian Robinson, we're probably expecting to be our RB too early, and then maybe Jalen Warren you're looking at as a flex play. But I don't mind Donta Foreman at all. I think he could do well. Anybody would, else you'd rather it, ahead of it, him? It would either be him or Herbert. I, I like Herbert because I think that he may not even be on the Bears. So I like kind of holding him and be like, what if he gets cut? He goes to Dallas, something like that happens. I think that that'd be kind of an, he, I could see his ADP moving a lot in an upcoming Five month. seconds. Herbert. Herbert or Foreman. Herbert. <laughs> I like that. So we're going to be back on the clock pretty quickly here. And this is round 16. We are going to need a kicker. We are going to need a defense soon. It's time to kind of decide whether we want another quarterback or another tight end, fill out those spots. Do you want to lock in a decent defense in San Francisco or take a good kicker in Justin Tucker and be able to forget about that? Or is there enough value here that you'd rather take somebody else? I mean, you, you're, you really want to draft Justin Tucker, don't you? That's, that, that's the I, vibe. Honestly, I'm, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I'm I mean, all right. Kicker, kicker, I can leave, but the Niners defense, maybe? I, I would rather take Tucker than the defense, so... Well, let's, let's do it. I mean, for anybody who isn't aware, not watching the video where you can see two Raven shirts behind me, I am a Baltimore Ravens fan. And the last time I drafted Justin Tucker was probably about 10 years ago in <laughs> my home league because <laughs> my guys all know that I'm a Ravens fan, obviously. Oh. And everybody thinks that they're sniping me on him. But rarely do I want to take one of the first kickers because we play in a 15-round format. And I just think there... When you start taking a kicker in round nine, round ten, just give me give me the guys like Young Wei Ku who always fall towards the end. And we were talking before we jumped on. I'll quite often just take a running. Uh, I'll quite often take a tight end. I'll try again. I'll quite often take a kicker. This is new to you, drafting had, kickers. It's very new. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll take a kicker right at the end who has a really late bye week, so that I just have as much time as possible and not even care about it. But I do think, in general, the Ravens' offense this year should score plenty of points. The defense is going to take a step backwards. And when you're talking about a guy like Justin Tucker, you can just plug and play. If you are drafting a kicker a little bit earlier, there's a few better options. Than it, that. Is, it is nice to have the peace of mind that we don't need to touch kicker until week 14. Like that, that is yeah. pretty nice. And at that point, this team could just be dead. It doesn't even matter. So it's nice to have one less <laughs> thing to worry about when it comes to waivers. Cause that's the risk you do take when you do wait till the end with some of these kickers and your streaming kickers. I think that it's, you want to be nice to yourself as a manager and okay. It's very hard to, I oh, got to stream quarterbacks this week. I got to stream tight ends, got to stream defenses, got to stream like to do all of it is hard to do. So again, some managers are up to the task and can, can do that, but give yourself a peace of mind. And we did see some of our running backs here that we were talking about go right after Justin Tucker. So we'll miss out on Foreman. We'll miss out. I did like, I thought Audrey Esme was another guy potentially we could have taken as well. But I think Herbert was a player that, again, these are bench guys. So, and we're drafting here in, it just was the 4th of July. We're drafting in July. So a month from now, we don't know Herbert could be on a different team. Like the athletic has rumored a lot or written a lot about how he could get cut. He could go to, I think there's something I put out in the Twitter sphere. What if he goes to the Raiders? Like he reunites with Luke Getze. 
You know, Ooh. what happens to Zamir White? Who's the RB1 in that scenario? You know, if Alexander Madison gets injured or, or whatever happens. So the thing is, at the end of the day, we know Khalil Herbert's good. And the reason that he's just not that is because he was a six round pick and he plays running back, which is just like unfortunate to him. But he's a good running back. And it wasn't that long ago that it was free Khalil Herbert over uh david montgomery <laughs> like that actually happened yeah. so i mean what if herbert was on the bengals like that's the guy we would all probably take because <laughs> he's the most talented guy so uh, i think that his adp could look very different when we're talking about his value wherever he ends up being or whether he's the rb1 in chicago a lot of scenarios where and there could be a scenario where it just bottoms out entirely and then we can just cut him and just move on from him yeah so I think one of the reasons why I was comfortable taking a kicker there is obviously we can start up to three a week, but we're sitting here in round 16 and we've got six running backs. You know, we've got Jonathan Taylor, Jalen Warren, Brian Robinson, Tyler Algier, Elijah Mitchell, Khalil Herbert. So much as I do like Don Foreman and I don't even mind Audra Kestame or I can be talked into Tank Bigsby late in best ball drafts normally. I think what we've built is... We need Jonathan Taylor to smash. If Jonathan Taylor doesn't have a really good year, we're in trouble straight away. So we're looking for two running backs out of the next five who we can start each week if we decide we want to start a running back in one of our flex spots. Then at wide receiver, we've got AJ Brown, Brandon Ayuk, Devonta Smith, Chris Godwin, Roma Dunze, and Josh Palmer. Again, we've got six in that position. So I think we're quite balanced, but I was kind of happy enough to just say, we're going to show up an area which is going to be tricky at times. And just having Justin Tucker, a guy who can get you eight, nine, ten points quite often, is going to be fine. Since Justin Tucker went to us, we have saw the Eagles defense go, the Bills defense go, the Niners, and then the Colts. So defense is really flying off the board. There is one team out of 103 now with three defenses, which is interesting we have the colts and the browns on the same team going out of the 105 so it feels like defense could dry up pretty quickly so if we were hoping that we could get to round 20 and still have good options that might no longer be the case do you have some good late round options for us at defense or do you think we might end up having to take one fairly soon well, if everyone's drafting three defenses, then yes, we may be in trouble. <laughs> so I, I will say that. I'm His looking. I'm going to pop up on waivers. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've got a lot of teams that are drafting multiple defenses, so y- this is important. Like, you have to read the room sometimes. So we may not be able to push defense as much as we want. However, I still think that we can push it a little bit because I think there are still defenses that I like that are still available. Again, before I hopped on the show, I did kind of some. Late DST, a defense I really like a lot in redraft formats is Seattle's defense because the first two weeks they play the Broncos and Patriots. So I was talking to Tom about that when we first jumped on. Seattle's ranked really low in ADP, but they have the two best matchups you could ask for for a DST, whether you think Seattle's a real-life good defense or not. That doesn't really matter. It's really more about the quarterbacks they're playing in. If they have the potential to play two rookie quarterbacks, then I think that will be okay. So I, I don't want to take a DST here. DST here. I think we can push it. So let's look at some of these skill positions. Yes, we've got Wondell Robinson, Alexander Madison, Marvin Mims, Michael Wilson, Aaron Rodgers, Rashad Bateman, Keaton Mitchell, Roman Wilson, Will Shipley, and then down to kickers, really. We've got 40 seconds. Uh, anybody there that I haven't mentioned that's standing out? I like some of the rookies. So I, I, I like the Denver receivers. So Mims or Troy Franklin. I think that maybe we could see if, okay, if Cortland Sutton gets traded, Okay, you're going to see these guys rise up in price. I think that we could see one of them pop up early on in the season. So maybe we have a, a diamond in the rough. So I like Denver receivers and uh, Lou McCaffrey would be the other guy. So out of Denver receivers, strong lean to Troy Franklin or Marvin Mims with 10 seconds to go? Mims. Okay, so I'm, we're going to take Mims. What is it that pushes you to Mims over Franklin? Well, his ADP is higher, so I knew that uh, he probably wouldn't last as long as Troy Franklin, but I really do think it is close between the two. My, I guess with Mims, I just saw the explosive upside last year at the NFL level, and for Sean Payton to not realize that and actualize that, man, I just think that he has a ton of upside. And I think Mims is also the guy where we see preseason game week three, and Mims is playing with, 
Zach Wilson in the third quarter, well, we can just cut him. <laughs> we can just totally move on and not worry about it because we're going to have more concrete information about other players. I wouldn't even be opposed if we double dipped on the Broncos receivers. We have both. One of them emerges as the number one, and then we cut the other one. So that's a potential strategy we could also entertain here because I don't think, I mean, right now at quarterback too, like we only have one quarterback, but are any of these guys really moving the needle for you? Like, oh, we need to draft this guy as our backup. Whereas, uh, I quite like Geno Smith. Okay. I could make a push for Geno Smith. Mayfield's kind of okay, but um, in terms of where we're at, yeah, Geno's the only quarterback I'd really push for here rather than waiting around unless there's anybody standing out to you. No, I would agree. Geno would be the guy for me. I mean, tons of weapons that he has. Underwhelmed last year. I think it was more in the box score. I don't think his actual play was really that bad. So, yeah, I'm cool with Geno here. Yeah, so if we take Gino here, then we're definitely looking at defense when it comes back to us in round 19 or 20 and possibly even two of them. But I think that's a problem I'm willing to push there because the quality of quarterback who's likely to make it back to us, we're going to be looking at the Russell Wilson, Bryce Young kind of tier. So Gino Smith gives us a nice, reliable start. I don't believe that we're going to see him benched for Sam Howell this year. Partly because the things that Gino isn't great at, Sam Howell is worse at. Sam Howell takes sacks so consistently, and that was the knock which was put on Gino Smith. The offensive line did not help Gino Smith out last year. But Sam Howell, I mean, we were talking about like record breaking pace for the amount of sacks he was going to take. So I'm much more comfortable saying Gino Smith's going to get right this year, or at least to a level where they leave him out there. And if they bench him in week 17, week 18, then we've got Kyler Murray, who, barring injury, should absolutely be the quarterback we're looking to start every week anyway. Yeah, I, I think Geno is a perfect backup to have. He goes so late. He was drafted. He was so productive you know, two years ago, you know, before last year. He was very, very productive as a pack, uh, pocket passer. He's got good weapons. It just kind of didn't work out in the touchdown column. The offensive line was also very injured. Basically, from the first week of the season, their tackles both went down. And, okay, now we're kind of searching for answers across the offensive line. So I think that attributes to a lot of the lack of success he had last year. But I think you're right. He stands out much differently than the other backup quarterbacks. And he's someone that we can also move on from. So we need to cut somebody, make some roster space. He's our backup. So, And I don't necessarily anticipate all the quarterbacks to be necessarily drafted. We'll see how things shake out, but we saw Drake may obviously go here, but we'll see if all of the backup quarterbacks get drafted. Yeah. There's just, there's not the same pressure in a redraft draft like this, that there is in a best ball draft where it's like, this is your only opportunity to grab them mm -hmm. here. We are going to have opportunities. There is a waiver wire run before the season starts where we can grab players. There is going to be other opportunities, Defense feels like, because, you know, there are only 32 defenses. There's not going to be any more that are created. There are a couple of teams with three already. The team out of the 103, the team out of the 108. Both have three now. Multiple teams who've got two already. So let me just scroll up a little bit. So, yeah, you can see the team out of the seven spot has taken... Ku as their kicker and then taking the Eagles, the Texans and the Bengals, I imagine some of these end up hitting waivers when these teams need spots for them. But I think it's also not a bad strategy to try and dominate the room, to try and force a panic. And being calm and not reacting to a panic, not trying to end up getting swept up when there's a run on a position is always something that can help you when you're in a room. I feel confident that we can get two defenses if we want to take two, or at least one that we'll be very confident in that's going to be good. The Chiefs defense is probably the top one on the board at the minute. And we mentioned earlier that week six is this all play week where you need points, you need to get a win in that week because everybody is just playing everybody within the league. I kind of wonder whether if the Chiefs didn't have a week six bye, Coming off being fantastic last year, do you think they'd be going much higher? Do you think that week six buy is what's kind of holding them down? It must be because we yeah. have some sharp DST drafters that know who they're going for. 
I think, even though I do kind of disagree with again, not necessarily where these DFCs are being drafted, but I think Baltimore's defense kind of went a little high with all of the regression yeah. they have. And they also play the Chiefs week one. Like That's not necessarily like a, a great matchup right out of the gates. They also have a very just generally tough schedule overall. So I think that's kind of an interesting pick there. But yeah, for the Chiefs DST to be going this late. And that's kind of why I felt like we could push DST because I came to the table here today. I had four DSTs written down of late round ones that we could take with our last pick. Like that was my idea. If I, if we have to take a DST in the last round, 19 or 20, who would we take? And right now only one of those defenses has been drafted. And that, that team was the Colts and there goes the chiefs off the board. So there are still three DSTs that I felt confident going into this draft that, Hey, we could draft this with our last pick. And they are the Seahawks who I talked about earlier because they play the Broncos and Patriots the first two weeks of the season, just, absolute layup matchups the chargers they play the raiders week one they also have a very favorable schedule they also have a very underrated defense overall like it's a team that's always had good pieces together that just never been able to put it together and then the defense that i'm still kind of surprised is still available is the detroit lions and it's because i think that this team is going to have so many opportunities for turnovers because if they're yes. winning a ton of games who's going to be they're going to be facing like DST comes down to who's facing the most passing attempts. Like that's really what you're looking for. Who can get and generate turnovers and sacks. And this was something I wrote about when the Detroit Lions schedule came out, you're looking at, Oh, all they do is playing dome games. You're thinking shootouts. And most of the time that reverts our brains to, okay, I don't want to draft teams that are playing in shootouts, especially DSTs, but most DST scoring is not how many points you're giving up. It's, how many turnovers can you generate? How many sacks can you generate? When you look at projections for DSTs, the Lions are projected to have the most sacks in the NFL next year, along with the most interceptions, because teams are projecting them to play in high-scoring games where you're more likely to see sacks and turnovers. So the Lions were the other team that I kind of uh, checked off as a late DST to target, and they're still here on the board, along with the Seahawks and the Chargers. So I, I feel pretty good still, even though all these DSTs have already been drafted. Yeah, and there are a few teams who don't have much in the way of defense. We're coming up on a range of a draft where the team out of a nine spot has no kicker, no defense. The team at the 10 spot, one pick ahead of us, has a kicker and Kaimi Fairbairn, but no defense. The team at the 12 spot who has taken three quarterbacks, there's no kicker or defense. So there's going to be some interesting decisions made around here. I wouldn't be surprised if teams leave the draft without one of those positions maybe we saw a bit of a run on kickers with jake elliott jason myers evan mcpherson jake moody and cameron dicker go off and yeah i think try to bet on defensive scoring it's not always the way like you say going for a team like the niners or the cowboys those teams tend to keep scoring so low that it doesn't really present the opportunities for turnovers so i'm quite comfortable with what we've got we're back on the clock do you want to take a defense here and then decide whether we want to take a second when it comes back around the corner does the guy behind us does he have a defense yet or no he's got no defense and no kicker so i think he's definitely how many hitting it okay i just want i so i think we should take just one defense because i think i want to get tucker craft on this team uh excellent so we can either take him now and wait, or we can just take... I don't know. Do you have a preference on DST? I, I know the ones yeah. I listed off, I but I really don't care. No, I'm good with... Um, I like your shout on the Lions defense. Yeah. Uh, I think that ticks a lot of boxes. Right. And then that. Tucker Craft, I think we're kind of safe to push him around because the team at the 12 spot already has three tight yeah. ends. It wouldn't be crazy to see a team take a fourth. But I think, given they took Laporta very early, then Chigakonkwa and then Jelani Woods, I think we're all right. So yeah. I will queue up Tucker Craft, who, yeah, I'm surprised he went this late. If I'd known he was going to go this late, I maybe would have gone with the Musgrave pick. But having three tight ends in a 20-round tight end premium draft is definitely viable. I've played a lot of the Superflex format here on FFPC, which is best ball. Ended up finishing eight out of 100,000 people there last year. And four tight end builds in that format have done really well. So I think you never want to underestimate how many you're going to need here. Uh, the team at the 12 spot does take Tyler Bass and then 
the Seattle Seahawks is their defense. Lucky and took a craft and get ready for the season. Let's do it. First redraft team in the books. So let me scroll up and recap this team properly for us. So we did pick out of the 11 spot. AJ Brown, Jonathan Taylor, Brandon Ayuk, Devonta Smith, Chris Godwin, Brock Bowers, Jalen Warren, Brian Robinson, Kyler Murray, Roma Dunze, Josh Palmer, Hunter Henry, Tyler Algier, Elijah Mitchell, Khalil Herbert, Justin Tucker, Marvin Mims, Geno Smith, the Detroit Lions defense, and then Tucker Craft to round things out. How are you feeling about this roster when we look back at it? Is this, is this winning $1 million, Andrew? I think if our tight ends can hit, I think it can because the rest of our roster is really strong. And when you're looking at this from, again, I don't necessarily draft a lot of tight end premium. This is really the only format that is tight end premium that I've really been exposed to. So to me, it's like this team is so good, but then I'm like not factoring in like, Oh my God, like all these other teams have elite tight ends and could, could bury us. If, if we can't get any type of production from Bowers, Henry, Tucker craft, et cetera. So, but we got to take some risk somewhere. Like you have to sacrifice something. So we built a very strong roster. I think at every other position and all we need is if this tight end room hits in our favor, Henry, you know, starts out the season really productive. And then Brock Bowers follows it up in the second half as a hammer and maybe elite tight end similar to last year doesn't hit nearly as much as people would expect it to, especially because tight ends get hurt. Like it's a very, can we talk about how injury prone running backs is like tight ends are also very injury prone too. So we took less risk by taking these tight ends a little bit later. I think, yeah, we took, I think one of, we had one of the latest tight end builds going with Brock Bowers. I think it was the Njoku team that also went, um, or the Dallas Goddard team also went late at tight end too. So that's where our disadvantage is at the tight end. And that's obviously kind of that special wrinkle in the FFPC. So, but yeah, if, if Bowers, if, if our, if our group of tight ends can hit, with the rest of our team, I think our running backs are good. I like our hero RB approach, our receivers. I mean, Godwin's our wide receiver four. <laughs> oh yeah. Like in a full PPR, like, come on. And yeah. I think we have a ton <laughs> of upside on our bench too, with Odunze, all the, the backup running backs to the one Oh two and one Oh one. We should have just drafted a uh, Braylon Allen to round it out. So we had every single first round running back in their backup, just embracing chaos. So yeah, I do. I do like the team a lot. And, Here's to just Brock Bowers, man. Let's go. Be a beast. Yeah, Brock Bowers at tight end 10. That absolutely feels like, in this format, a risk worth taking. And of course, you kind of look at that and you go, okay, well, if we switched out Brock Bowers there, who would we get in? You know, are you going to go, instead of Brock Bowers, you're looking at Kenneth Walker, Zach Moss? Like, I'm completely comfortable making that Brock Bowers pick there. I think... Yes, these kind of wide receivers in this range, Rashi Rice, Tank Dell, Amari Cooper, are all interesting. But Brock Bowers, to me, you need some upside. We're talking about a contest where we're looking to take on not just the 12 teams in our league. We're looking to make that championship round weeks 15 to 17. We're looking to have enough juice to be able to take on all these other teams we've got there. And there'll be a lot of teams within that who have similar builds to us. But where you can get leverage is just the little the little differences you have. Like us having Devonta Smith and AJ Brown, I think that's a great leverage point. I think having Brock Bowers paired with somebody like Hunter Henry who can carry him is great. Roma Dunze, somebody who can come on later on in the season. Multiple running backs who could become the RB1 if injuries hit. I like that. I think that Geno Smith is a great quarterback too. It just feels like a lot of fun. Anything that you would have done differently looking back at it now, just a pivot point where you're like, maybe we should have done this slightly differently. Marvin Mims is it's not going to make this team. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I just have, I have such buyer's remorse now, just like thinking about it. now I'm going to have to read everything Sean Payton says about Marvin Mims and how he's not going to make He's <laughs> He's running with the backups and I'm like, I'm going to be messaging you, Tom, be like, do we cut him now? Like, do we wait? Like, what are we doing? So, I mean, he was a late round pick. So, again, I, I talked about Mims when we made the pick versus him and Troy Franklin. I, I think it really is close to a coin flip. So, we'll see how things shake out. But, no, I think overall, I, I'm pretty happy with the way that we built things. I didn't feel like we were really 
reaching at any point. We got to dabble in that the RB2 range that I like having as that rotating carousel at RB2. This is just why I like the hero RB approach because I don't feel any pressure. Oh, I need to draft running back. Well, we have Jonathan Taylor. Like he is our stable guy that we're going to have locked in every single week. And then RB2 slot, it's that carousel. Oh, well, who's playing well? Like who's the hot hand? Is it Jalen Warren? Is it Brian Robinson? Like which one of these guys is actually playing well based on them being in more of committee situations in their respective backfields? And that's okay. You know, we're not asking them to give the Jonathan Taylor production. And so, yeah, this is just looks like a team that two guys that have been drafting basically since February have, have drafted together. So I'm glad that we've teamed up on this, Tom. And it this, this, is, this is a fun team. I think at the end of the day, you can look back and be like, hey, this team could be some fun. Uh, I'm excited about that. Yeah, and it all comes back to having fun. And like you say, the running backs in particular give us so many opportunities that we can play the matchups. We can play which which running back has the best situation this week, which is the must-start player. And of course, here on FantasyPros.com, we are going to give you all that information each and every week. If you enjoy this draft, remember, you get $25 off your first entry, $350 fast and slow drafts drafts happening all the time up until the games get going it's a lot of fun would highly recommend doing so the biggest redraft contest out there we'll be back next week for another rises and fallers episode we'll be looking at who's going up who's going down in price but we're also going to tell you why they're going up and down give you that context tell you whether we're buying or selling because of it hit the thumbs up hit the subscribe button be sure to let us know what you think about our team can it win one million dollars and we'll be back with you very soon. Till next time, we'll see you in the lobbies.